Tiny Habits was written by B.J. Fogg, who is the founder of the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University. He is one of the world's foremost experts on the science and psychology of behavior change, and his work in this area has had a significant impact on the way we approach habit change. Whether we're talking about product development or whether we're talking about personal development, if it involves change, B.J. Fogg is your guy. And in Tiny Habits, he shares his research-backed insights on habit change and why it doesn't have to be as hard as you might think it is. Here's what you'll learn about in this audiobook summary. We'll talk about the key to creating habits that stick. You'll learn about how to use the FOG behavior model as a framework for creating the changes you want to see in your life. You'll learn how to use formulas to help new habits take hold and much, much more. A quick tweetable summary to describe this book in a nutshell. You can start making major changes today by taking minor actions. The notion That all change is hard? Well, it's a myth. In reality, change can be easy if you know the simple steps of behavior design. A few crucial quotes pulled directly from the book before we dive into the big ideas. Quote, If there's one concept from my book I hope you embrace, it's this. People change best by feeling good, not by feeling bad. Quote, Bad habits are not fundamentally different from good habits when it comes to basic components. Behavior is behavior. It's always a result of motivation, ability, and a prompt coming together at the same moment. Ready to dive into the big ideas? Let's get into it with big idea number one. Tiny is mighty. It's likely that you've got at least one thing in your life right now that you'd like to change. Most people do. Take a moment right now to think of that thing that you want to change in your own life. Would you like to change your diet and begin eating healthier? Would you like to change the way you look by losing weight? Would you like to change your way of life by exercising more? Maybe you want to reduce your stress or get into better shape. Maybe you'd like to make more money. Maybe you want to become a better parent or partner. What about your productivity? Are you as effective and efficient as you can be? Or is that an area you'd like to improve as well? Almost everyone wants to make some kind of change. But there's a painful gap between what many people want and what many people actually do. You see, most people don't eat the way they want. They don't look the way they want or feel the way they want. Despite what they want, many people continue to be overstressed and underrested. Their finances are not where they want them to be. Their relationships are not where they want them to be. They're not as productive or creative as they want to be. Why is there such a disconnect between what people want and what people do? Should people be blaming themselves for not doing the things they know they need to do in order to see the results they want to see? No. Should you be shaming yourself if you don't exercise as often as you want to? Should you shame yourself if you don't get enough work done today? No and no. B.J. Fogg, the author of the book, Tiny Habits, tells us that it's not your fault if you're not doing everything you want to do. And it isn't as hard as you think it is to create positive changes in your life either. It's not you that's the problem here. It's your approach to change that's the problem. It's a design flaw, not a personal flaw. When it comes to change, tiny is mighty. As he writes in the book, the essence of tiny habits is this. Take a behavior you want, make it tiny, find where it fits naturally in your life, and nurture its growth. 
If you want to create long-term change, it's best to start small. Big idea number two, the fog behavior model, B equals map. Quote, behavior happens when motivation and ability and prompt converge at the same moment, unquote. Most people know that if you want to change your life, you're going to need to change your behavior. But what most people don't know is that there are only three simple variables that drive those behaviors in the first place. Enter the FOG behavior model. The FOG behavior model is the framework you'll be using to understand and unlock the mystery of how habits take hold. It'll help you install helpful habits and uninstall unhelpful ones. As Fogg puts it in the book, his behavior model represents, quote, the three universal elements of behavior and their relationship to one another. It's based on principles that show us how these elements work together to drive our every action, from flossing one tooth to running a marathon. Once you understand the behavior model, you can analyze why a behavior happened, which means you can stop blaming your behavior on the wrong things, like character and self-discipline, for starters. And he says you can use his model to design for a change in behavior in yourself and in other people. So, if you want to understand why you do what you do, or don't do what you know you should do, it's important to understand the following formula. B equals MAP. Behavior is the result of our motivation, M, plus ability, A, plus prompt, P. B equals MAP. That's the basis of the FOG behavior model. B equals MAP. A simple formula that can lead to incredible results. Here's how it works. A behavior happens when the three elements of map, motivation, ability, and prompt, come together at the same time. So the motivation, M, is your desire to execute a behavior. Ability, A, is your capacity to execute a behavior. And prompt, P, is your cue or trigger to execute a behavior. Your motivation can be either high or low, depending upon your level of desire to create change, meaning how badly you want to do something. Your ability can be either high or low, depending upon whether something you want to do is easy to do, which would make your ability high, or hard to do, which would make your ability low. Now, your prompt is what triggers you to do or not do your desired behavior. So, Let's take a couple of examples to illustrate this idea. Now, in this example, we'll be doing two examples with the exact same behavior goal, and then we'll run them through the model. Let's say you'd like to create the behavior of writing in your journal every morning. So in the first example, let's plug things in here. With behavior, the B part of the B equals map formula would be to write in your journal immediately upon rising every morning, right? So that's the behavior you want to create. Now, your motivation here, the M in the formula, is high because you really want to make this a habit. And then moving on to ability, the A part, that would be high as well because taking a few minutes to sit down and write in your journal is pretty easy to do. Therefore, your ability would be high. And finally, the prompt, the P part of the formula, and We get into this by understanding that first, your motivation is high, your ability is high, so now all you need to do is create a simple prompt that triggers you to take action. Now, this might be as simple as keeping a pen and a notebook on your bedside table so that it'd be easy for you to grab and write inside of each morning, or it could be keeping it on your desk so that as soon as you sit down at your desk, First thing in the morning before you begin your work, you can start writing in your journal. Whatever it is, the prompt is a cue that triggers you to take that action, to do the behavior, to execute the habit that you want to develop. 
Now, on the flip side, let's take the same exact desired behavior of journaling every morning in this example and tweak the variables a little bit. Moving on to the second example, example number two. Now, remember, same desired behavior, which is to write inside your journal immediately upon rising every morning. So that's the same. Now, your motivation, the M part, is now decreased. It's gone from high to low in this second example, which means you no longer really want to write in your journal every morning. Moving on to the ability part, A, your ability level, of course, remains high since it's still pretty easy to actually do the thing, to do the habit, writing in your journal. And then finally, the prompt, the P part, has now been removed altogether. Your notebook is now hidden inside of a drawer instead of placed at your bedside table to see first thing every morning. Again, your prompt is now gone. The thing that reminds you to do the behavior is no longer there. Your notebook isn't at that bedside table anymore, so keep that in mind. Now, let's compare these two scenarios. Example number one was set up in such a way that you would effectively be able to help yourself install that desired behavior and turn it into a habit. But example number two, well, that's a different story. In the second example, you don't feel like writing in your journal anymore. So your motivation is gone. Your ability level remains the same since it's still pretty easy for you to actually write in your journal. But now your notebook is hidden in a drawer, which means your prompt, which reminds you to execute the behavior in the first place, is gone. Now that we've decreased your motivation and removed your prompt, how likely do you think you would be to do the behavior of journaling every morning? Not very. So two things to remember here. Number one, a behavior happens when the three elements of MAP, motivation, ability, and prompt, come together at the same moment. Motivation is your desire to do the behavior, ability is your capacity to do the behavior, and prompt is your cue to do the behavior. Number two, the second thing to keep in mind is that you can disrupt a behavior you don't want by removing the prompt. Now, this isn't always easy, but removing the prompt is your best first move to stop a behavior from happening if you don't want to do something. Now, this can be either good or bad, obviously, depending upon whether you want to do the behavior or whether you don't want to do the behavior. If you do want to do a behavior, well, you want to make sure you keep that prompt highly visible and you want to have something that triggers you or reminds you to take action. But if you don't want to do a behavior like, say, eating junk food, well, it would be a good idea to remove the prompt, i.e. in this example, removing the junk food from your cupboards. All right. So that way. You don't have that reminder, ooh, delicious chocolate or yum, 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 Lay's potato chips or Doritos to remind you to say, oh man, now I want this. The prompt is gone, so you'll be less likely to indulge. You get what I'm saying? So B equals MAP. It's a simple formula that applies to all human behavior, and it can become a catalyst for change if you use it, and that is is phenomenal news because you can run any and all behaviors through this model. You can use it to create new habits and you can use it to break bad habits that you want to get rid of. So your actionable insight here for the second big idea is to try running one of your own behaviors through the fog behavior model, through the B equals map model. Simply do this. Write down first behavior, or you could just write down B. And next to that, write down a behavior that you want to start doing. Start executing a habit maybe that you want to start. Underneath that comes the M part. So this is the motivation. So are you highly motivated or are you not so motivated to do this thing? And then moving on to the A part of the formula, that is ability. Is it pretty easy for you to do it, or is it kind of tough for you to do it? And then finally, the prompt, P. This is simply about placing a trigger or cue or some sort of reminder to get yourself to do the behavior, to make it as easy as possible to 
jog your memory or to trigger action for yourself to get started with this habit or behavior that you want to develop. So run this through the B equals map model for yourself, plug in a behavior that you want to develop, or maybe even one that you want to break and run it through for yourself in your own life and see if you can get some results. Moving on, big idea number three, place your prompt above the action line. Quote, when a behavior is prompted above the action line, it happens. Unquote. Now, in the last big idea, you learned about how B equals map. Behavior happens when motivation and ability and prompt come together at the same time. Now, in the book, BJ provides us with a simple graph to drive this idea home. I'll explain it, break it down for you real quick. Feel free to hit pause and play and rewind a few seconds back if you need to listen to it once again. But essentially, it looks like this if you could envision it in your mind's eye. Now, along a vertical axis, we've got motivation, the M part, which can either be high or low. So imagine a vertical line with motivation written in the middle in big, bold letters. And then at the very bottom of that line is the word low, signifying low motivation. And at the very top of that vertical line, we've got high, signifying high motivation. So motivation is along the vertical axis. If you imagine a graph. Now, next, we've got along the horizontal axis, we've got ability. So imagine ability written in the middle there in big, bold letters. And then this can be either hard to do or easy to do. Now, on the left-hand side, signifying low ability is written hard to do. And then all the way on the opposite end of that horizontal axis is written easy to do, signifying that something is easy for you to do. Now, finally, we have our prompt, which lands either above or below a curved plot line on this graph that I just described, which is called the action line. So it's a curved line, a plot line, if you remember from grade school, on a graph that's called the action line. Now, the position of your prompt in relation to the action line is crucial because it determines whether you'll actually do a behavior or not. If your motivation is high, for instance, and your ability is high, meaning something is easy to do, your prompt lands above the action line. This is as good as it gets. It means your chances of doing your desired behavior are high, so you'll succeed. Now, on the other side, on the flip side, if motivation is low and your ability is low, making something hard to do, then your prompt lands below the action line. And this makes your chances of doing your desired behavior slim to none. As BJ puts it in the book, when a behavior is prompted above the action line, it happens. Suppose you have high motivation, but no ability. Let's say you weigh 120 pounds, but you want to bench press 500 pounds. Now, you're going to fall below the action line and feel frustrated when you're prompted. On the other hand, if you are capable of the behavior but have zero motivation, a prompt won't get you to do the behavior. It'll only be an annoyance. Now, what causes the behavior to be above or below the line is a combination of motivation pushing up and ability moving you to the right. So the easy to do part. So the motivation, imagine again, that vertical axis, motivation, horizontal axis for ability. So the key here is a combination, a combined effort of motivation pushing you up towards the top of that axis, the vertical axis, and then ability moving you towards the right, making it easier to do. And the key insight here is this, behaviors that ultimately become habits will reliably fall above the curved action line. 
So to give you an example to illustrate, I broke this down for my staff. So when I'm doing deep work, I told them that I'm often tempted while I'm doing that deep work, that focused work, to check my phone and either order something on Amazon or quickly reply to emails or texts or whatever. And this, of course, would break my focus and prevent me from doing my best work. So here's what I did to break this behavior. The behavior I want is to focus on doing deep work. And if we think about the B equals map formula, the behavior in the B equals map is to do deep work and stay focused for three hour blocks of time uninterrupted and to do this at least once a day, just a focused block of time. Now, my motivation, the M part, to check my phone whenever it buzzes is, or was rather, somewhat high on a moment-to-moment basis. But this would break my concentration, and I knew that on a deeper level. My motivation to do deep work, to bring my best self to work, was far higher, right? That motivation to get good, quality, high-quality, deep work done That motivation was far higher than checking my phone every now and then. But it was still too easy for me to fall into the let me just check my phone really quick trap. So how'd I fix this problem? Well, I adjusted my ability to check my phone by just removing the prompt altogether. That is the phone. Now, my ability level used to be at easy to do because my phone was always on my desk or in my pocket while I worked. This prompted me, naturally, to check it whenever I glanced over at it or felt it vibrate in my pocket. So, I removed the prompt by taking my phone, putting it on do not disturb mode, walking it over to my other office down the hall, and then placing it inside my desk drawer. Now that I've removed my prompt, it's way harder for me to check my phone every time I get even the slightest urge to do so. And it was way easier for me to stay focused on my work. When I had my phone nearby, it served as a prompt that landed below the action line. Now that I have eliminated that prompt, I know I can reliably dive into my work and develop the habit of working deeply for at least one three-hour block of time each day. Big idea number four, the anatomy of tiny habits. Quote, the easier a behavior is to do, the more likely the behavior will become a habit. This applies to habits we consider good and bad. It doesn't matter. Behavior is behavior. It all works the same way. Unquote. Now that we understand that behavior equals motivation plus ability plus prompt coming together, let's get into the ABCs of tiny habits. Number one, we have the anchor moment. That is an existing routine like brushing your teeth or an event that happens like a phone ringing. The anchor moment reminds you to do the new tiny behavior. Second, we have the new tiny behavior. That is, a simple version of the new habit you want, such as flossing one tooth or doing two push-ups. You do the tiny behavior immediately after the anchor moment, which is, again, an existing routine that you've already got in place. And then finally, third, we've got instant celebration. That is, something you do to create positive emotions, such as saying, I did a good job. You celebrate immediately after doing the new tiny behavior. A, B, C. Anchor, behavior, celebration. Here is how this might look when you apply it to a real-life scenario. Let's say you want to boost your physical strength by exercising more, and you decide that doing push-ups is a great way to do that. Here's how you might plug this in to the ABC Tiny Habits approach. Anchor moment. After every bathroom visit, you'll do your new tiny behavior. The new tiny behavior, instead of exercising for a pre-blocked period of time like, say, 45 minutes a day, which you've tried and failed at in the past, you simplify the behavior 
and make it super tiny by planning to do two push-ups every time you take a bathroom break. This makes the behavior too small to fail and puts your prompt above the action line. And then finally, we've got the C, celebration. Each time you crank out your two push-ups, celebrate by shouting, I'm awesome, or by fist pumping the air or by silently but exuberantly whispering yes to yourself. However you do it, take a quick second to celebrate each time you do a behavior, no matter how small, because it goes a long, long way, which we'll discuss in some of the upcoming big ideas. But for now, here's an actionable insight for you. When you design your own tiny habits, always remember to make them super tiny. Make them so small that it's impossible to fail. Floss one tooth. Do two push-ups. Take two sips of water. File one thing. Respond to one email. Fold just one item from your laundry basket. Clean for five minutes. You get the idea. Make them tiny. Super, super tiny. Make them too small to fail. Big idea number five. The seven steps of behavior design. Quote, If our attempts to create this habit don't work, we will troubleshoot, starting with the prompt. And we won't blame ourselves for lack of motivation or willpower. What we are doing is all about design and redesign. If we need to tap into willpower, we're doing it wrong. If we revise the prompt and make the behavior as simple as possible, and we still don't succeed, we'll back up and pick a different behavior, one that we actually want to do, unquote. In the book, BJ describes the seven key steps in the behavior design process. Let's break each of them down one by one. Number one, clarify the aspiration. What do you want to accomplish? Number two, explore behavior options. What needs to happen in order for you to accomplish your aspiration? Number three, match with specific behaviors. What is it specifically that you can do? Number four, start tiny. Break the behavior down into something so, so, so tiny that it feels silly not to do it. Number five, find a good prompt. Find a good prompt by connecting the behavior to something you are already doing. Number six, celebrate success. Hack your brain's reward centers by celebrating immediately after you do a behavior. Every action deserves to be celebrated, no matter how tiny. Number seven, troubleshoot, iterate, and expand. Keep tweaking, keep adjusting until you find what works. Perhaps you're motivated, but your prompt is below the action line, preventing you from doing the behavior, in which case you adjust the prompt and try again. Remember, you are not the problem. Your approach to change is. It's a design flaw, not a personal flaw. Big idea number six, anchor prompts. Quote, you already have a lot of reliable routines, and each of them can serve as an action prompt for a new habit. You put your feet on the floor in the morning, you boil water for tea or turn on the coffee maker. You flush the toilet. You drop your kid off at school. You hang your coat up when you walk through the door at the end of the day. You put your head on a pillow every night. These actions are already embedded in your life so seamlessly and naturally that you don't have to think about them. And because of that, they make fantastic prompts. It's an elegant design solution because it's so natural. You already have an entire ecosystem of routines humming along nicely. You just have to tap into it. Action prompts are so much more useful than person prompts and context prompts that I've given them a name. 
anchors. When talking about tiny habits, I use the term anchor to describe something in your life that is already stable and solid. The concept is pretty simple. If there is a habit you want, find the right anchor within your current routine to serve as your prompt, your reminder. I selected the term anchor because you are attaching your new habit to something solid and reliable. Unquote. The aforementioned quote that you just heard comes from a chapter called Prompts, The Power of After. In that chapter, BJ teaches us about the single most important part of the map equation, prompts. Prompts are cues or triggers that get us to take action. They're the invisible drivers of our lives. Behaviors do not happen without prompts. Now, a great way to use a prompt is to create habit recipes. For example, in the book, BJ mentions that whenever he works from home, his tiny habit is to do two push-ups after every visit to the bathroom. That is a habit recipe, with the operative word being after. By connecting the things you already do to the habits you want to install, you can create habit recipes of your own. Here are some examples. After I go to the bathroom, I'll do two push-ups. After I hear my timer go off, I'll stand and stretch one body part. After I finish working out, I'll go for a quick walk around the block. After I wake up and brush my teeth, I'll meditate for 10 minutes. After I finish meditating, I'll begin working on my one most important project of the day. In the book, BJ shares hundreds of habit recipes for various areas of life. Now, have you noticed the pattern here that each habit recipe follows? It goes like this. After I anchor, I will new tiny habit. Again, after I insert the anchor, that is the thing that you already do, I will new tiny habit, the new thing that you want to do, attaching it to something solid and reliable. So after you do the habit that you already have implemented in your life, I will start doing the new habit, tiny habit that I want to do. So it creates a seamless transition from something that you're already doing regularly to something that you want to do. So here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Use the formula below that we just mentioned and we'll go over quickly again to identify a new tiny habit that you want to develop by attaching it to an anchor, a solid and reliable routine that you've already got going on in your life. So again, after I blank, that's where you put the anchor in, I will new tiny habit. After I blank, I will blank. So try it out. Write it down on a notebook or on a pad of paper. First, write down after I and then a blank, comma, I will, and then another blank. In the first blank, you put your anchor, that is, the solid and reliable routine you've already got going on, like brushing your teeth. So after I brush my teeth, I will, that's where you put your new habit in, another blank. After I brush my teeth, for instance, I will meditate for 10 minutes. So try it out. Feel free to hit pause before you move on to the next big idea and create some tiny habit recipes of your own. Big idea number seven, emotions create habits. Quote, emotions create habits, not repetition, not frequency, not fairy dust, emotions, unquote. When you're designing for habit formation, whether it's for yourself or for others, what you're really designing for is emotions. When you log on to Instagram and upload a picture, you're given the option to use a wide set of filters to beautify your photo quickly and easily. You pick the one you like best, maybe tweak the picture a bit, and then boom, you now feel like you're sharing a beautiful work of art. Now this creates a positive feeling, prompting your brain to release dopamine, which makes you want to use that app again. You share your beautiful post, your photo with the world, 
and people start responding with likes and comments. And then this, too, creates a positive feeling, prompting your brain to release more dopamine, which makes you want to use the app again. Can you see how quickly this can become a habit? The most popular social media apps are designed as habit-forming products, and each of them is built by weaving in the principle that emotions create habits. And this framework applies to habits you want to develop as well, regardless of what area of your life that habit might relate to. Exercise, money, meditation, reading, flossing, punctuality, social interactions, the list is infinite. Another important point that BJ makes in the book relates to an idea that you may have heard about in the past, that it takes 21 days to form a habit. Well, for too long, he writes, people have believed that the old myth that repetition creates habits is true, focusing on the number of days it requires. Some of today's popular habit bloggers still talk about repetition or frequency as the key. Just know this. They are recycling old ideas. They have not done groundbreaking research. In my own research, he says, I found that habits can form very quickly, often in just a few days, as long as people have a strong, positive emotion connected to the behavior, unquote. Let me just repeat that really quick. If you have a strong, positive emotion connected to the behavior that you want to develop, you will boost the likelihood of forming it into a habit more quickly, far more quickly, with higher velocity and impact. So the bottom line is this, emotions create habits, and you can't change or create any habit without involving your emotions. So keep that in mind as you move on to the next big ideas that we're going to be going over as you build your own habit recipes and tiny habits and as you implement these concepts within your own life it's so crucially important that you involve emotion into the equation as you create your own habits big idea number eight celebrate and feel the shine quote what might surprise you is this In English, we do not have a perfect word to describe the positive feeling we get from experiencing success. I've read piles of scientific literature on related topics, and I've done my own research in this area, and I am convinced that we are lacking a good word. The closest label is authentic pride, but that is not an exact match. So, with the encouragement of three of the world's experts on human emotion, I decided to create a new word For this feeling of success. Ready? I call this feeling shine. You know this feeling already. You feel shine when you ace an exam. You feel shine when you give a great presentation and people clap at the end. You feel shine when you smell something delicious that you cooked for the first time. I believe my celebration technique, he says, is a breakthrough in habit formation. I hope you can see why. By skillfully celebrating, you create a feeling of shine, which in turn causes your brain to encode the new habit. If I could teach you tiny habits in person, I would start our training by focusing on celebrations. I would help you find celebrations that are natural and effective for you. We would practice them together, and it would be a blast I would train you in celebrations before teaching you about the fog behavior model or the power of simplicity or anchors or recipes for tiny habits. Celebrations would be first because it is the most important skill for creating habits, unquote. Now, extending on the previous big idea, that emotions create habits. In this big idea, we'll dive into the incredible power of celebration and how celebrating our small successes helps us build better habits. When we celebrate immediately after taking action and we do so with intensity, we're able to hack the reward centers in our brains via dopamine, which wires the habits we want to develop more quickly. Now, the crucial key here to this technique is to celebrate immediately 
every single time you take action, even if it's the tiniest little win. Not an hour later, not a week later, not a month later, after accumulating lots of little wins leading up to a big win. None of this will work. Celebrate immediately, within seconds of taking action. Why so much emphasis, by the way, on immediate celebration? Well, because the brain is better at linking the feeling of reward, celebration, or shine to actions when we close the time gap between action and celebration. It gets a lot less effective when we wait. It gets less potent when we wait, when we let lots of little wins leading up to a bigger win to build up before we finally allow ourselves to celebrate, to give ourselves a pat on the back. It's less potent. When we elongate the time between positive action and celebration, the intensity of emotion weakens. And because emotions create habits, we want to ensure we make it as easy as possible for our brains to link up our actions with our emotions, thus ingraining the habits we seek to develop more quickly. In the book, BJ even goes as far as saying that celebration will one day be ranked alongside mindfulness and gratitude as daily practices that contribute most to our overall happiness and well-being. So if you learn just one thing from this whole book, remember, celebrate your tiny successes. Celebrate. Make sure that is a key takeaway that you get from this audiobook summary and the book in general if you decide to pick it up and read that. So that one small shift in your life can have a massive impact even when you feel there's no way up or out of your situation. Celebration can be your lifeline. Keep that in mind. Bottom line here is this. Immediately after you do a tiny thing you planned on doing, indulge yourself in a quick celebration that feels natural. Some quick examples to get you going. First, one example is you could raise your arms in the air and yell out, yes. Or you could say, I'm awesome. You could yell out, boom. You could give yourself a quick fist bump on the chest. You could clap your hands. You could literally pat yourself on the back or shoulder. You could whisper to yourself, I'm the greatest. Or you could simply smile. The main idea here is this. Celebrate every action that moves you forward. If you can't think of a natural celebration for yourself, here's a quick exercise to help you out. Example scenario number one. You've just applied and interviewed for your dream job. You'd nervously wait for your potential employer to get in touch. And then, all of a sudden, you get the email. Good news! You got the job! What do you do in that scenario? That is your celebration. Example scenario number two. You crumple up a piece of paper and toss it into the trash bin 10 feet away from you. Like a basketball player shooting from the three-point line. Boom! It goes in. What do you do in that moment? That is your celebration. Example scenario number three, your favorite sports team is playing a championship game against its greatest rival. The game is tied and it could go either way. And then all of a sudden, with only a second left on the clock, boom, your team scores and wins the game. What do you do in that moment? That is your celebration. You get the idea, right? So your actionable insight for this big idea is this. First, create a celebration for yourself that feels natural and do it every time you do your behavior, the tiny habit, whether it's two push-ups, flossing a single tooth, responding to one email, etc., etc. Celebrate immediately after you execute that tiny habit. And equally important, celebrate with intensity, that is, emotion. And do both of these two things I mentioned And you'll strengthen the habit that you seek to develop, whatever that habit is. And you'll experience that wonderful thing, that wonderful feeling of shine. And by the way, if you want to hear a podcast episode on the same concept, it's something that I, Dean Bakari, have discussed on my own podcast called Dean Bakari's Meaningful Show. And you can access it and find it on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify 
I've linked it up in the text version of this book summary on Tiny Habits. But in that episode, I also discuss this concept and the power of celebration and this feeling of shine that BJ talks about in his book. Closing notes. The key takeaway from Tiny Habits is this. The easier you make it for yourself to do something, the more likely you are to actually do it. And if you increase the likelihood that you'll do a behavior, you'll also increase the likelihood of turning it into a long-term habit. So here's one final quote pulled directly from the book to keep in mind as we close out this audiobook summary. Bad habits are not fundamentally different from good habits when it comes to basic components. Behavior is behavior. It's always a result of motivation, ability, and a prompt coming together at the same moment.